Hello, everybody, and welcome to Flock Talk. Today, we are going to be going over how you can create a bomb-proof recall, where your bird will be able to come when you call them, no matter what the circumstances. This tutorial will be assuming that you have already taught basic recall to your bird, meaning that they can stand on a perch, you can hold your finger a distance away, and they will be able to hop onto your fingers with little to no distractions. This tutorial is all about how to get your bird to recall away from temptations and be able to function around various reinforcing distractions. The first activity that I'm going to do is try to teach my birds how to recall away from a food temptation. One of the biggest temptations for our birds tends to be food, and it will probably be the hardest thing to try and recall them away from. How I'm going to set this up is I'm going to select a little dish and a food of some sort that is pretty low value to my birds. I want this to be something that they're interested in and that they want, but not something that's so excessively valuable that it's going to make this even harder for me to begin to teach them how to recall away from it. So this could be something like their base pellets, this could be maybe a vegetable they don't like very much, or a lower value food like millet. And then on my end of things, I'm going to make sure that whatever treat I am using in this activity is going to be something that is extremely high value. I want there to be a 0% chance that whatever is in this dish is more valuable than what I have. This is one of the few instances where having a really high value reward is critical in training because we are competing with different motivators here. In this instance, the birds are going to be very motivated to eat the food that is in the dish, and I'm trying to compete against that with whatever I am holding and have to offer them in exchange for leaving that thing that they have freely accessible. So it's really important that I make it worth their while and ensure that I am using a reward that is highly valuable. In this instance, I am using walnuts. For some birds, this might be things like sunflower seeds. Usually it is some form of fatty nut. So how I'm going to set this up is I am simply going to present the dish with just a few low value seeds inside. I don't want to put an excessive amount because there is a very high chance for them to want to leave it alone if there is a lot if I put it in there right away. So I'm just going to drop two or three seeds inside the dish at first and this way if I call them and they don't come right away they're only going to be gone for maybe half a second while they finish those two other seeds before coming to get me. This is okay. We are just encouraging the idea of them being recalled away from a food dish and away from a food source. The fact that they've completely finished the handful of tiny seeds that were left in there is not super important at this point in time. We're just beginning to introduce the idea of walking away from where a resource was and where a resource could be. So I have the low value seeds and just going to present my hand and recall them. If I call them and they remain really distracted by the food and they don't know to come around, I'm going to help them. So you could use a target stick for this or you could just show them the food that you're offering. Do keep in mind that if you are luring them like I am in this footage here, you want to make sure that that reward is highly valuable. When you are using something like a target stick, it's a lot easier for them just to remember that, hey, touching the stick is super valuable and could lead to any number of enjoyable experiences for me, and it'll make it more likely for them to leave it alone, regardless of what they actually end up getting for targeting. With luring, if they look at the seed that's in your hand and they know that's what they're going to get, it's a lot more likely that they'll go, eh, that's not as worth it as this dish of seeds is to me in this moment. And that's where you can run into some problems. In this instance, I'm using luring to show that it is possible, but using a target stick is usually easier and usually yields more results, provided that that target stick already has a really long established history of valuable reinforcement for them. So all I'm going to do is put a couple of seeds in there and then present my hand and recall the bird. If they struggle and keep trying to eat the seeds, I will show them the treat that's in my hand and try to guide them away. When you're luring them, it is important to reward them for every step they take away from that dish. If they turn to grab the snack and then you quickly yank the snack away from them, they're going to go, oh, well, that's not worth it then. And then they'll turn around and go back to the food that's more easily available. Instead, what you want to do is offer them a treat for the fact that they even lifted their head up and away from the dish at first, because that is the first step to recalling is just disengaging from the treats that are in front of them. So what you'll see me do, especially with Toto, is I will recall him. If he doesn't respond, I will present the treats to lure him. And then I will offer him a couple of bites of the walnut that's in my fingers as he slowly walks away. And this is not only helping him learn that 
taking that first step is valuable, that just disengaging is valuable, but that for every step he takes away, more and more and more of these really high value treats are present and it's going to become more valuable for him the longer he walks away from that dish. And over time we're going to start to see that excitement build and a lot less of this luring being needed. So every time it's going to be virtually the same pattern. I'm going to drop some seeds in the dish, I'm going to give them a couple seconds to enjoy that snack, and then I'm going to present my hand and call them, rewarding them if they even look away from the dish, if they take a step away from the dish, and if they're struggling, like you see Toto doing, I will then present the treat, make a bunch of kissy noises, make myself really exciting, and guide him away from the dish, and make sure to give him a really big treat when he does successfully recall all the way to my hand. I'm going to be using different volumes of rewards based on how he responds. So if I did have to lure him and guide him all the way back, I'm going to be giving him really small pieces. I'm going to give him a couple for all the steps that he goes away from the dish for, but they're going to be pretty small. So it's still pretty valuable to him, but there's more he could be doing in order to earn bigger chunks. If I call him and he immediately lifts his head up and turns around, that's going to earn him a bigger jackpot. So I'm going to give him a bigger treat, a larger number of treats. I'm going to make it worth his while for that big step he decided to make away from the dish. And what this is going to do is it's going to start turning him in the right direction. So now he sees, okay, if I choose to stay by this dish, it is a less valuable experience for me. The dish treats in this dish are less valuable and the treats I get in response for being so slow is less valuable versus when I quickly turn around and run, I get the biggest hunk of walnut I have ever seen in my life and I want to do that again. So this adds a lot more clarity into the situation where now Toto is realizing that being slow and needing to be lured yields smaller rewards while turning around quickly and running straight for me yields much larger rewards. And what this is going to do is it's going to encourage him to want to move faster to want to respond the second that I call him and to be excited when I do because he wants that larger piece of walnut. With Toto, this is all very, very new. So what we're getting with him is a lot more luring. Toto doesn't really understand that there's value in walking away from the resource and is needing a lot more of my guidance to get him out of there. So what I'm going to start to do is every time that I've lured him away, my next step is going to be to make that treat that I'm having to guide him away with less visible. So now he doesn't actually need to see what I have to offer before deciding whether or not it's worth it to walk away. And all I'm going to do is pinch the snack between my fingers and that's usually enough to make that transition. Because he already knows my fingers in that pinched position means that a really valuable snack is there. He just doesn't necessarily know what it is, although the last six times he walked up here it was a walnut. So he has a pretty strong suggestion to think that it is going to be a walnut again. And that's exactly what we want. We want him to see my hands being presented and have him think, oh, something valuable could be there. Not that the valuable thing has to be visible in order for him to be able to respond. Remember, we want him to be able to recall out of any situation regardless of if I actually have food on me in that moment or not. So I'm going to conceal that treat between my fingers and still be visually luring him but the treat is no longer visible. And we will get the exact same response out of him over and over and over again, where I'm able to easily guide him away, but the treat does not need to be seen by him in order to get that result. The next step from this is going to be phasing out how much I need to lure him away from the bowl. And this usually starts to phase out pretty quickly once the birds start to understand how valuable it is to walk away from that dish. So simply by luring them away and giving them a treat for walking away, and then allowing them that access to go back, we have set up a situation here where there's no real conflict in deciding whether or not to walk away from the dish. If he walks away, he will get a treat from me. And when he gets a treat from me, he can easily be allowed to go back to that dish and enjoy the resource he had before. It's a best of both worlds situation for him. He leaves it for a moment, he still gets to go right back to what he was doing. And that is adding some additional reinforcement into the situation with something called Premax Principle. Premax Principle is basically a less desirable behavior is being reinforced by getting to do a more desirable behavior. And in this instance, the more desirable behavior is being able to sit there and gorge on the seeds that are in the dish. And the less desirable behavior is walking away from it. So every single time that I've called him away and then let him go back, I am getting him to do the least desirable behavior, walking away from that dish, and it is getting additionally reinforced by getting to go back 
to continue to eat the food out of that dish as well. So on top of the seeds and the nuts that he's being given directly from me, the behavior itself will become significantly stronger just based on the fact that he knows that he will be allowed to go back. In his mind, he's not actually having to really give up that thing that's in front of him because there's the very real potential that he'll be allowed to go right back to it. He knows it's not going to be taken away or stolen from him. It's not something he needs to have a lot of conflict and worry about. He gets to just walk away knowing in full confidence that he can turn around and it'll be right there. And he will get to exhibit that delicious eating behavior all over again. So as I work on phasing out the lure, all I'm gonna do is still show Toto my pinched fingers, but I'm not gonna have them right close to his body anymore, and I'm not gonna be guiding him away. As he gets better and better at this, you'll start to notice that before I even have the chance to start luring him, when I presented my hand and called him, he already knows what I'm about to be asking of him and that that lure hand is about to show up. So he'll start jumping the gun and start getting excited for those pre-cues of me presenting my hand and calling him, knowing that the lure hand would soon follow. He'll start getting preemptively excited about that. So he will turn around and begin to recall. So my lure hand is still going to be present, but it's present from a distance. So if he turns around at the sound of that recall, it's still there. It's just further away. If my lure hand was suddenly not visible too early into this process, he might get excited at the sound of the recall, thinking that the lure hand will be there, and then he'll turn around and it's not there, and he'll go, oh, you have nothing for me, and he might turn around and go right back to what he was doing. And we don't want him to practice that. So I'm going to play it safe, and I'm still going to keep the lure hand visible, just further away so he does have to actively leave the dish and fully recall before he can reach the lured hand. The more confident Toto gets with this, the more we'll be able to phase this out and we will be able to get to the point where the lure hand is no longer visible. So with each repetition with that, I'm basically just going to slowly take my hand from that pinched position where I'd be holding a treat between my fingers and I will slowly turn it into like a generic fist and then I'll slowly put the hand down by my side or up against my chest or my stomach and just kind of gradually remove that hand from the situation so Toto is no longer needing to rely on it in order to respond to the recall. And now that we're getting that really solid response out of him, where now my hand is able to be presented, I can call him and he will walk away with just the three or four seeds that are left in the dish, I'm going to make this more difficult. And I need to only make this more difficult if there is a 99% guarantee that I know Toto will respond. So this means in all of our previous repetitions, there hasn't been a doubt in my mind that when I call him with the three seeds in the dish, that he is going to turn around and come right back. If I set this up and move on to this next step too early, it could just undo everything that we've just done and make it significantly more difficult to get back to where we just were. So we really want to make sure that our birds are ready and fully understanding the value in walking away from this valuable resource before we move on and make it more complicated. So this next step is going to be having food freely available for the entire duration of that recall. So I'm no longer only putting three or four seeds in there where he could potentially finish all three and then be coming to me. I'm going to have it where now he can have a full dish of seeds and he could choose to gorge on them and ignore me and I'm going to have him choose to walk away from them even though there is other food still freely available inside that dish and this is where things are going to be very very tricky because now he really is having to decide whether it's more valuable to eat the food in front of him knowing that there is a lot more to go by the time that I've called him or if there is more value in coming to me, knowing full well that he will be able to go back and finish what he was doing. And if we've done everything right, this transition should go pretty smoothly. The first two or three repetitions, you may have to back step to luring just to ensure that success. The way I would go about it is I would call them and present my hand, let them peck one or two more times just to let them think and process. And at that point, I would bring in my lure hand and quickly guide them over to help them make the choice that I would like them to make in this situation. If you are doing this and you call them and you're luring them and they are struggling, then they aren't quite ready for this step. So you either need to go back to just presenting two or three seeds and practicing, or you can create an in-between step for this where you have an unlimited number of seeds available, but they're harder to access. And you could do this by having them crumpled up in a towel or in a more challenging forager. So that way the amount of work it takes for them to access that food is potentially more 
than the amount of work that they would put in just by coming to you instead and getting that high value treat. And that can be a nice in-between step to bridge this gap here to make it a little bit easier for some birds to transition. And this is going to repeat the exact same way as the previous step did, just with the added challenge of them having a ton of seeds to choose from, but still having to make the right choice that we want them to make by walking away from the dish and recalling instead. And you may find a little bit of conflict arises here, and so that's why you really want to make sure that you are paying them what this behavior is worth. And if they are walking away super well from something, or if you notice that they are actually struggling to make the right choice, but they made the right choice anyways, I would make sure to jackpot those moments because you can see that struggle, right? And if they really struggled to make that choice and they were really slow to move and they were really thinking about it, but they chose to come to you anyways, I want them to know that that choice was extremely worthwhile, so it will be an easier choice for them to make next time. If I focus too much on the fact that, oh, you were a little bit slow, you didn't come to me as fast as I want you to, and I don't pay him for how much work and effort and thought he had to put into making that choice, then the next time he's going to go, oh, you know, that was really difficult for me, and it was not worth it. it. I was not paid enough, the treat that I was given was not high enough value, I didn't have a good time. I'm not going to want to do that again. Whereas if he made that really difficult choice and I pay him extremely well for the work that he put in, he is going to remember that and the next time he faces it, he's going to go, oh, this is an easy choice to make. Of course I'm going to go recall to her. This was easy peasy. She paid me like 12 walnut pieces last time. That's worth way more than five millet pieces. Heck yeah. And it reduces that conflict and makes a way easier choice for him to make on the next repetition. Our priority right now is not necessarily speed. Our priority is just that they are having no conflict when they have to make this choice and that they are understanding that this is a choice that brings value to them. Speed is something we can work on later and it's something that usually naturally shows up later as they get better with this behavior and as the choice becomes easier for them to make. So I wouldn't worry too too much about nitpicking their speed at this point trust me, it will fall into place the more that they understand that there is value in leaving and that they are free to go right back to eating those snacks when they come to you anyways. And as we can see here in this second round of making things more challenging, Toto has caught on very, very fast. And let me tell you, this boy is food motivated. He will absolutely hunt you down for a simple, boring pellet. It doesn't matter what you have, Toto will engorge himself on it. He loves food. So the fact that he is calling away from free access to a ton of small seeds here is huge for him. He is an insanely food motivated little guy. And it's just so, so easy now for me to have the food in front of him, be able to call him. And what we can even see in some of these clips here is that I'm putting him down in front of a dish full of little seeds and there's more value in me. He is not really looking at the seed dish or I'm really having to bribe him to get him to go back to that seed dish because he's just too interested in interacting with me, which is huge for a guy that is obsessed with food and the food is just freely available. And the reason why this happens is because I've created a situation here where I hold an excessive amount of value now because not only did I have the more valuable resource for him with those high value walnuts, but we use the premax principle where choosing to walk away from the food gets reinforced by being able to go back to eat the food. So by default, he is now choosing to leave that food alone to come interact with me because it gets reinforced by getting to go back and do it anyways. And it creates this lovely little cycle where the interest in the food gets redirected to me first before going and being told to go and eat the food dish. So with this, we've now created a situation where our bird is able to recall away from something that they find extremely valuable in that being food. Now you can up the ante on this since I'm still using a really high value food in exchange for something that is low value. What you can do from here is actually reduce the value of the thing that you're holding or up the value of the thing that is in the dish. But with that, it's important to make sure that that pre-mac principle is in place first. Because if you suddenly just level out the playing field and your resource is same value as the resource they have free access to and they don't see any other value in disengaging from it, 
you very well could set them up for failure here where they're just going to turn around and gorge themselves on a bowl full of walnuts and not recall at all. So you do want to make sure that you are gradually decreasing the gap between your reinforcer and the one that is on the ground for them to eat from. So that way you are still providing a lot of reinforcement to them throughout this process. And there's a few things that you have on your side, even when both the reinforcer in the bowl and the reinforcer in your hand are the same thing. And the first thing is access. So when you call the bird away and you give them a treat, if you give them an entire full handful, it's something they can easily scoop in and enjoy a huge amount, that is easy access for them. They came to you and immediately were able to just stuff themselves silly with a chaotic amount of food for very little effort. Now, if your reinforcer on the floor were to be in a challenging forager, even though they are the same thing, the amount of work and effort they have to put into to resolve that forager could be enough where it is now less valuable to them because you are easier to access and the amount of food they can get in their face faster comes from you. And that can be an easy way to create more value in yourself, even though the food on the floor is the same. And applying principles like that in practice here is really, really valuable if you're ever in a situation where your bird has flown at your bowl and they are about to eat something that could potentially be toxic to them and say you're on the other side of the room and it's some freak incident where they've just flown across, so you can't get to them fast enough. If you then in that moment have them understanding that it doesn't matter how the food is in front of them or what it is in front of them, coming to get the food from you, whatever you may or may not even have, is going to be faster, more efficient, and in a higher quantity than whatever is on the floor that they can get themselves, you're going to get a speedy quick turnaround no matter what situation you end up in because the bird has such a strong understanding of how much value and how quick reinforcement can get to them by recalling to you instead. The last quick note we're going to add on to making a really bomb-proof recall is locations. So very often what will happen is a bird will fly up somewhere super, super high, or they might go into your back of your cabinets, and then they will not recall. And there's two main reasons why this can happen. Number one, they might not know how to fly down. A lot of birds, especially birds that just got their first set of wings in, will not have the muscle strength or skill to be able to actually fly downwards and land on you from various steepness of inclines. So it's important to make sure that they are strong enough to do that activity first and practice those declines ahead of time so that way they are strong enough to be able to fly like that in the first place. The second reason is usually just that it's really fun up high. And this is where the drill that we just finished doing with the seed dish is going to come in handy because this is just another form of reinforcement. Before the reinforcement was food on the floor, now the reinforcement comes with the fun and safety that they get by being up high or by chewing on the furniture up there or the decor that they are not supposed to be chewing on up there or the dark corners that they're being reinforced with because it's like a nesting cavity. All of those things are simply different forms of reinforcement. And by practicing the drill we did in the first side of this, they now understand the value of walking away and leaving something that they find reinforcing and valuable. And that skill can translate over to the value that they find in high places or dark crevices. So the first thing I'm going to do is just practice somewhere where the birds are about the same height as me. So if they do decide that they don't know how to recall, it's easy enough for me just to ask for some simple step ups and gradually work up to the recalls from there. Both of these guys are pretty stellar at their recalls in this room, so this isn't much of a problem for either of them, but for some birds, it might be. As we practice these, I'm going to start at a level where they're basically flying straight, just level parallel to the floor, and then with each repetition, I'm going to gradually actually lower myself so they are now having to fly downwards and practice declining onto me. In this situation, we are giving them the skill set for how to fly downwards to me. Sometimes they don't generalize the skill, they understand how to recall going straight, but they don't necessarily understand how to recall down onto a hand, or they don't understand how to control their flight well enough to be able to descend and land on a hand safely. So this gives you an easy way to check where they're at, see how strong their flight is, and get a feel for their confidence in flight. And a key difference you can see here between my two birds, Newt, who has been fully flighted for four or five years now, 
doesn't even hesitate when my hand goes up. He jumps straight down. He's not even thinking before it takes off. He has the strength and the power and the skill to be able to do that. When we compare that to Toto, who has only been flighted for a couple of months and has only been in a situation where he can actually stretch his wings for a couple of months, he is very hesitant. And we will see him shuffle back and forth on his perch. We'll see him do a lot of leaning and stretching. He is trying to figure out how on earth to get there and is very nervous about doing that. This is a very clear indicator that Toto needs more time to build strength and flight muscle and skill and confidence to be able to descend and fly down to me comfortably. And that's gonna be helped easily with these drills where I just stay underneath him and recall him and just making sure to adjust the steepness of the recall for him. So you'll notice for Newt, I was going virtually straight up and down. That's something he can do. Toto, I'm staying more slanted. So it's a much more gentle slope. It's a lot more achievable for him. I'm meeting him where he's at for his skill set. Asking him to go any steeper is just asking for injuries if he does decide to take off and he is not strong enough or understand how to do so. He could really hurt himself. So instead of challenging him and making him fly steeper, I'm just going to adjust my training and have my slope a little bit more gentle while his flight muscles develop more. Now that we've practiced this and we've got them to a point where they can recall downwards pretty consistently from this perch that I could easily retrieve them from if they happen to not be able to, I'm now going to move this to heights that I cannot get them down from unless I'm standing on a stool. And I'm also going to pick places that they already want to fly to and occasionally decide they don't want to come down from. So in my case, this happens to be my kitchen cabinets the most. So I'm simply going to present a situation where I pop them up there and recall them off. And this is a nice controlled training scenario in a real life situation where the birds don't often want to come down from this place or they find a lot of fun in this place or whatever is going on. They just really enjoy being up there and every now and then they'll just be like, no, I don't really want to recall. I'm having a good time up here. So this is a nice training scenario where now we are using the same location where I am having those problems in, but because it's in the context of training and they're not already motivated to go up there, I'm more likely to get a response from them. If I were to wait until they have chosen to go up there by themselves and they're already getting kind of weird and excited by being up there, then I'm going to have a lot more difficulty getting them down since we haven't practiced recalling down from there in that context before. So I'm going to just hop them up there with them knowing full well that I'm butt loaded with treats and going to have lots of good things for them. And I'm just going to ask them to come down. And what we will see is after doing that, the next repetition will be even faster. We'll see him excitedly leaning forwards. We'll see him wobbling and getting ready to go, immediately seeing my hand and knowing I want to get to that hand as fast as possible. That's where I want to be. And that's a really great shift in mindset. We can see that we've reduced all that conflict that he felt on that first repetition. And he now just feels really excited with the presentation of my hand. So now we've created this lovely situation where he will have a repertoire of recalling down here. He will have memories of being called off of here and it being worth his while. And additionally, we have Premac principle at play again, where he is having a lot of fun up there. I am asking him to do the less desirable behavior of flying down to me instead. And in return, he not only gets a treat from me, but he also gets to go back and do the behavior that he finds more desirable being up high, doing whatever the heck he is doing up there that he thinks is so fun, he gets that enjoyable experience again. And that makes it more valuable and more likely that he will do the less desirable behavior of recalling again in the future in an actual scenario where he is really motivated to be up there. So I'm going to repeat this process for all the areas of my home that I have these issues with or that I think could become a problem in the future. So I'll do various different kitchen cabinets and practice those same drills, make sure we've got the same levels of confidence. I will pick areas that are deliberately so high out of reach that there is no way I could access them so they can practice those different heights in those different locations in my home so they can build a repertoire and understand that recalling away from different areas that hold different reinforcement for them is super valuable and that I will make it worth their while if they do choose to do that. And that's going to wrap it up. You can do this with any number of things that your bird happens to find more reinforcing. If your bird likes to hide in the back of closets, you can practice this exact same thing as we did with the treat dish where you just let them go back to it after you've kind of lured them away, make it worth their while, 
pay them what that behavior is worth for the amount of effort and difficulty they are finding with the conflicting levels of reinforcers that are available to them in each scenario. Any situation you have had where your bird has been conflicted on whether or not to recall to you or has outright decided that your recall is not valuable enough, you can practice these skills with and teach them that recalling away from those situations is not only valuable to them in that moment, but doesn't always mean that they're going to be taken away from the thing that they find enjoyable, which is really what often ends up being the fallout for a lot of recall. If you are constantly exclusively using your recall just to take your bird away from things that they are finding fun, it will make the recall less enjoyable to them and can cause them to want to just flat out stop and not come to you because they know it means that their fun time is going to end. When you practice drills like these and you make a habit of recalling them and then putting them back to doing the thing they were doing before, you remove that from the situation where now recalling away doesn't always mean that the fun has to end. Sometimes it means they go into a different fun activity and sometimes it means that they can go right back to the activity they were doing before. This style of recall is so, so helpful when it comes to being able to have your bird recall no matter what the circumstances are. And honestly, those are the times when you need the recall the most. Having a baseline recall where your bird can come just when you don't feel like getting up to get them can be super helpful, but having a recall that you can trust in an emergency situation or when there is a temptation that is greater than you in that moment is so, so critical. Having that bomb-proof recall means that your bird will come back to you no matter what is going on and is well worth the effort you have to put in in order to get it. On top of this, another really easy way to make sure that your recall stays fresh and stays consistent is to practice it regularly. And this can be as simple as when you are faced in a situation in your day where you could easily just get up and get your bird, you choose to call them instead. It's a simple way to get them practicing recalling at random sporadic times and in a variety of different circumstances. So that will do it for me today. I hope you guys find this tutorial helpful, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye!